This video was brought to you by Brilliant. For most of modern history, Europe has been partially dependent on Russia for its gas imports. And as we've described in previous videos, Putin's invasion of Ukraine and apparent willingness to use energy as a geopolitical weapon have forced Europe to reconsider this relationship. And many European countries have now started looking elsewhere for their gas supplies. So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at some hypothetical pipelines that could replace the Russian gas shortfall in Europe, and whether they might actually get built. Let's start with a little bit of context. The Russo-European energy relationship really started in the late 50s and early 60s, with the rise of Arab oil nationalism. Now, World War II accelerated the European energy transition away from coal to oil, but most of Europe didn't have its own domestic oil supply. Originally, Europe relied on its colonial outposts, mostly in the Middle East, to guarantee their oil supplies. But as time went on, as regional instability took hold and Arab governments decided to nationalise their oil industries, things became increasingly difficult. In fact, Europe struggled to keep a hold of its oil-producing colonial outposts, which meant that A, they had no guaranteed access to oil, and B, the oil they did have access to wasn't denominated in their national currencies, which put a real strain on public finances. Now, Europe decided that this was an intolerable state of affairs, and in the late 50s, various European countries decided that buying oil from the Soviet Union was the least worst option, despite the obvious geopolitical risks. As early as 1958, Italian energy giant ENI was in negotiations with the Soviet Union for a large-scale oil deal, and they weren't alone for long, quickly joined by Austria and West Germany. Anyway, once Europe had started buying Soviet oil, it was only one short step to buying Soviet gas. When European gas consumption stepped up in the 1970s, this was done mostly via the Ukrainian transit system which first opened to Europe in 1967 and was gradually expanded, with the last development coming in 1988. But this was only the start and was quickly followed by Yamal Europe, which first sent gas to Germany in 1997 and was finally completed in 2006. This apparently wasn't enough though, and in 1997, construction began on Nord Stream 1, which was finally completed in 2011. And on top of that, Turk Stream was originally commissioned as Blue Stream all the way back in 2005, and was completed in 2020. You get the idea then. Europe's energy dependence on Russia has a really long history, which partly explains why Europe is finding it so hard to reduce its Russian gas imports. In fact, some European countries have even resorted to buying liquefied natural gas on the international markets. But A, it's significantly more expensive, and B, some countries like Germany lack the facilities to actually receive and transport LNG. Nonetheless, though, there are various other hypothetical pipelines that could solve Europe's gas crisis. Some of these have been made possible via recent gas discoveries, like the fields in the eastern Mediterranean, while some of these were always available but were scrapped in favour of Russian pipelines. So in this video, we're going to take a look at three pipelines which could save Europe. Transcaspian pipelines from Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan into Turkey via Azerbaijan, an East Mediterranean pipeline from Israel to Greece, and a Trans-Saharan pipeline running up from Central Africa up to Algeria and then through to Spain and Italy. Let's start with the Trans-Caspian pipeline though. Central Asia has significant gas reserves, with Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan having the 6th and 15th largest proven reserves anywhere in the world. So the Trans-Caspian pipeline, first floated by the US back in 1996, would run under the Caspian Sea connecting Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan to the Southern Gas Corridor, which currently runs from Azerbaijan through Georgia into Turkey and then on to the rest of Europe. However, there are two problems with this project. Firstly, Russia wouldn't be keen on it. 
and the 2018 Convention on the Legal Status of the Caspian Sea gives it the right to object to any new pipeline on environmental grounds. Secondly though, the Southern Gas Corridor currently sends only 10 billion cubic meters of gas into the EU every year, representing just 3% of the EU's total gas imports. So for this pipeline to materially reduce Russia's gas exports to Europe, we'd require a massive upgrade to the Southern Gas Corridor's capacity. And as such, it will probably also require the building of the western part of the Nabucco pipeline, which would run through the Balkans up to Hungary. The Nabucco pipeline, by the way, was originally a plan to reduce Europe's dependence on Russian gas, but was scrapped after pressure from Russia. The second pipeline is a new East Mediterranean pipeline, otherwise just known as the East Med. This pipeline would connect two major gas fields in the Israeli and Cypriot EEZs to Greece and then on to Italy, and would have the capacity of about 12 BCM per year, representing about 4% of the EU's total imports. Now, these two fields were only discovered in the early 2010s, and commercial production in one of the fields only began in 2019, and is yet to even start in the other. Despite only being discovered relatively recently, East Med looked promising for a while. In January of 2020, Greece, Cyprus, and Israel signed a provisional agreement to begin construction, backed by the Trump administration. However, in January 2022, the Biden administration decided that it didn't like the project, both for environmental reasons and also because it was a point of contention for Turkey, who contested Cyprus's maritime claims in the region. The third pipeline we're going to take a look at is the Trans-Saharan Pipeline, a pipeline running up from Nigeria through Niger and all the way up to Algeria. Algeria itself has substantial gas reserves and currently sends a significant amount up to Spain, Portugal and Italy, representing about 10% of all of Europe's imports. In fact, in July, Italy signed a new deal with Algeria to boost supplies and is now expected to receive an impressive 20 BCM of Algerian gas in 2022, about 25% higher than the historic average. However, while Algeria clearly plays an important role in Europe's energy supplies, if the Trans-Saharan pipeline goes ahead, it could become significantly more important. And that's because Nigeria has the world's ninth largest gas reserves, mostly deposited in the Niger Delta, which is where the Trans-Saharan pipeline would start. The pipeline would have a capacity of about 30 BCM per year, representing about 10% of all of Europe's gas imports. Now, this pipeline was first proposed in 2002, but technical problems and concerns about regional stability and safety have delayed it indefinitely. Now, both Nigerian and Algerian second pipelines would need serious maintenance and upgrades to carry that volume of gas, and various terrorist groups, including Touareg rebels and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, operate in this area. But nonetheless, there's clearly still a demand for this pipeline. And in July of this year, the Algerian, Nigerian, and Nigerian ministers of energy reaffirmed their commitment to this project. So, all in all, those are the three pipelines that could, if not erase, then at least reduce Europe's dependence on Russian gas. And while none of them are near-term solutions, and any pipeline would have to be balanced against the environmental considerations, they're all real options for a European continent that will somehow have to find a way to replace its main energy supplier if it wants to continue using gas at the current rates. Now, seeing agreements and disagreements over energy and pipelines certainly plays into the idea that decisions made by countries and leaders are uh, random and without any real purpose. However, if you'd like to be more logical in your decision making, then you should check out my favorite course on Brilliant. Their logical thinking course might start simple, but it builds, teaching you logical reasoning skills until you're solving problems which previously looked impossible. And you'll get used to that empowering feeling of learning, because Brilliant's not just about memorization and lectures. Brilliant teaches you by doing, using active learning techniques to teach you the principles behind otherwise complex subjects, and ensuring that you actually understand what's going on. 
Using this teaching methodology, you can learn about all kinds of STEM topics. That's algebra, applied probability, calculus, gravitational physics, and even cryptocurrency. In fact, they even have a new course from Kurzgesagt, which I have to say, I found very personally exciting and spent a lot of time playing with. Anyway, if you want to learn in a more fun way, then you should sign up to Brilliant. And the link in the description will get you 20% off an annual premium subscription, which is not only a great deal, but also supports the channel. So thank you.